Good morning. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. First of all, um, we have, well, we have several birthdays during the month, obviously, and several an, uh, wedding anniversaries. And we have uh, Paul's and Karen's anniversary today. Happy anniversary. And we need to sing a happy birthday to our friend John here. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear John. Happy birthday to you. You know, if you have a birthday on a Sunday, we're going to embarrass you. Please pick up an announcement sheet. There's a lot going on during the week. I cannot announce it all, so please read through what is going on. There are several committee meetings. Several committees are meeting this week, especially Altar Guild tomorrow morning. There's an important meeting for all of you here in the sanctuary. We're going to um, uh, go through the new protocol to offer communion to the congregation. So on June 5th, you're coming to the altar to receive communion. Altar Guild and whomever can help ushering. I need ushers. Be here tomorrow morning at 10. And all assisting ministers who have the morning free or that one hour free at 10 o'clock here so we can practice. Anything else is on here? And we have a quick announcement for our council president, Ed Lewis. Okay, am I on? There we go. I had it turned the wrong way. Um, I'm, I'm sure that most of you are wondering what's going on with our building and uh, when are we going to get the front of uh, Wine Miller Hall repaired. Um, council met after our uh, congregational gathering on April 24th. They met the following Saturday and had some discussion about how to move forward. Um, we have decided as a council to hire a public adjuster who will do exactly what the insurance company adjuster did, come in, evaluate the damage that's here, put together an estimate and give it back to the insurance company and say, we think this is the amount of damage that we have. So we've hired an adjuster. I've started working with him and they're looking at everything on both buildings that have damage that should be covered by insurance. And so we're trying to come up with a, a total cost of the repairs. Um, in the meantime, we're working with a contractor to get started on the front of Wine Miller Hall to do um, a temporary repair until we can get this interaction with the insurance company going. So the repairs to the front of the building should be happening very soon, whether it's the end of this week or beginning of next week, I'm not really sure, but we'll be going at, at that, and you'll see um, a temporary repair going up so that at least we waterproof the front of that building and not get any more damage from rain. So that's where we're at, and I'll keep you informed. Thank you, Ed. Let us put ourselves in the presence of the Lord, ask for God's Spirit to assist us in our prayers today. In the first reading, we hear that God opened Lydia's heart to hear the words of Paul. Let us pray that God may open our heart also to hear God's Word. We come to faith in different stages and from different corners, different uh, walks of life. We may be at that point when we need a refresher. God needs to recall us, call us back. Perhaps some of us will need um, um, to have that reboot <laughs> um, button being pushed. Um, let us pray that the Lord may be kind and merciful to us so that we may grow in faith. Thank you. 
come together this day drawn by the light of God's love. In God's eternal realm, peace and hope reign. Let all the people praise God with their deeds of loving kindness. pray. Beautiful God, you gather your people into your realm and you promise us food from your tree of life. Nourish us with your word that empowered by your spirit we may love one another and, and the world you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. The moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun was dead. The Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us. The weight of every curse upon him. Oh, 
reading from Acts, chapter 16. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river where we supposed there was a place of prayer and we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, Come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to John. Jesus answered Judas, not Iscariot, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine but it's from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I'm still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I'm going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. The Gospel of the Lord. Before going, before going to bed last night, I wanted to print my sermon so that I wouldn't be rushed this morning. And I was always I mean, uh, when I try to print something at my home, I'm always anxious because you never know if you get anything you ask the printer to do, but it did print, so I went to bed relieved. And then obviously this morning I forgot to pick it up. <laughs> so I'm using the laptop. But I wanted to print it here, and we are without internet in the building. So anyhow. So the first church I had was St. Pius Catholic Church in Cincinnati, Ohio. 
that church was made up mostly, 99% of African Americans. Um, it was a huge, beautiful building that the African Americans inherited from um, the white community that had ever since left. So I had a bunch of people in a huge church trying to maintain a building that became very quickly, very costly. Just as we have costs here, we had huge costs there, you know, um, roof started leaking, the beautiful uh, glass windows we had had covered up um, plastics, I believe, that started molding, so we needed to replace those. The heat or the cooling system, uh, you know, needed to be uh, fed with fuel. So the costs were pretty high. That was the cost of having a building in a small community. Buildings cost. Then I went to a church in um, Massachusetts. Our Lutheran church there ha did not have a building. So I said, oh, this is free of costs. And it was, for some part, we only needed to uh, raise the money for rent. We rented a local grange. We needed to pay utilities, cleaning, and that was about it. Uh, I felt pretty free to move around and visit with people and have off-campus ministry, such as the blessing of animals. We went up the hill to a, bar, to a farm and had our service in the barn. That was pretty cute. And then I came here, and we have such a beautiful, huge building, and it does cost, but the building is, is important for us to gather in, to be protected from the elements. We need to have that, even though we like free life and move around. But this helps us to get together at least once a week and have some common prayer. It's a place where we can worship, we get religious instructions, we get some fellowship, and we get some ministry development. As you heard me say, during the week, we have a lot going on, and committees meet to project um, new ministries. The early church, though, was a house ministry. They didn't have a building, obviously. The disciples had experienced the resurrection of the Lord, and they started talking about to others and gathering people around them not only to read the Hebrew scriptures but also to hear the wonderful story of this one anointed by God who was killed but then was brought back to life by the power of the Spirit. So th soon the church started gathering around the apostles the apostles gave them their blessing and they needed to keep themselves busy announcing the word to others. They would still gather originally on the Sabbath day. Then obviously they chose Sunday because it's the first day of the week, the day when Jesus was risen from the tomb. And they um, received instructions from the apostles. And then during the years, they would get letters from the apostles. Paul's letters were the first ones to arrive. And so they would read and pass on those letters and get instructions that way. And um, it, they uh, constantly were recommended not to neglect the Sunday gathering, because that's where they could hear the Hebrew scriptures and the letters from the apostles. Eventually, the next generation needed some more in-depth catechism, and so the Gospels were written. But the apostles themselves were free to move around. On the screen, you see Paul's second trip, second missionary trip, out of the tree he had. He ended his life in Rome, a martyr. But during this second trip, he heard a voice, as you heard 
proclaimed from the book of Acts. He, ha he heard a voice in a dream asking him to come to Macedonia. Macedonia is that region above Greece. And so soon with his companions, he set up to go there. But in the meantime, he tried also to reach um, the places on his way. He needed to pass through Asia Minor. And he tried to reach regions in um, Bithynia, Phrygia. But somehow he was impeded. The Bible actually tells us Luke tells us in the Acts, if you read a few verses before the verses where we were assigned for today, Luke tells us, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but it's at the very tip of modern-day Turkey. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but again, the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. I don't know about you, but many times in my life, I have tried to do something only to hit my head against a wall. I guess that's a common experience, isn't it? Encountering impediments and obstacles. I guess that's God's way of saying, nope, not now, maybe later, not this way. And so our ego gets bruised, our mind confused, and what happened to our bottom lip goes out, right? In those occasions, especially if our ego gets bruised and our bottom lip sticks out, we need to honestly ask ourselves if what we wanted to do was truly for God's sake, or was intended to build ourselves up. Let's be honest. Sometimes even in our most ardent prayers, we think we are seeking God's will, but in fact, we are responding to our deepest fears and embellish that with holy thoughts and glorious words. So in the reading from Acts, Paul gets it. God has other plans. They renounce to pursue their own plans and instead cross over from Asia to Europe. And the gospel is finally brought to other nations. When we hit our head against a wall, we may want to remind ourselves that we are not in control. God's plan is not our plan. We cannot see beyond the reach of our noses. God's plans may not make sense to us in the moment and may totally contradict what we think we need to do to enhance even the kingdom of God. Our logic often does not work in God's vision. When we become aware of that, that's a good time to exercise prudence and humility. In those times, the challenge is to take a leap of faith. God is all around us doing what God normally does, creating new life. We may not see it. We just need to trust and commit fully to it in obedience and humility. You know, I've been going through a period of darkness myself and wondering if that was the will of God or just my sinfulness, my limitations. It's been pretty challenging.
Well, my computer is shutting down anyhow, so I'll go on with that. It's pretty challenging. <laughs> but if you, if you think about the lunar phase, there are times when the moon looks just so pretty, just a wedge of it, and then it starts filling in, and it's full and bright and beautiful, and then it starts diminishing, and it's dying, whatever we call that, setting. And then we have a, a new moon. And what's the color of the new moon? It's dark, right? In the darkness, there may be new life. Actually, God assures us of that. In darkness, there may be new life. And so Paul and his companions take it to stride, trust God, take that leap of faith, and jump into it. Cross into Macedonia and in Philippi, which the Acts of the Apostles tell us was a Roman colony. A Roman colony um, created by the emperor so that all the soldier, soldiers who had um, retired from fighting could retire there. So that, that was a retirement community, Philippi. Uh, you may call that Little Italy. I mean, all the Romans, all the soldiers of Rome went there to retire. So there was, um, it was an affluent city. There were some Jews, but they had no synagogue. So they went to the river, perhaps the prettiest spot of Philippi, and there they gathered for prayer. Somehow Paul had wind of that, and with his companions went down to the river to pray with whomever they could find. And as they prayed, Paul felt moved to announce the word to Lydia and whomever was present. And as Lydia was listening to the word preached by Paul, God opened her heart. And she and her household got baptized. Now, obviously, God was already there at work. As a matter of fact, Luke tells us she was a worshiper of God. God was already present. God, there is no place in the whole globe or in the whole universe where God is not present. The ground was already fertile. Paul announced the word of grace. Forgiveness and reconciliation to God in the Spirit. And she received that word and got baptized. And then the next line we read in Acts is she was so enthusiastic about her new, new faith that she invited the apostles to come to her house, stay there rather than at the inn, stay at her house, keep preaching for a while. Then obviously, that in Philippi becomes the first Christian congregation, I mean, uh, uh, the first congregation in, in, um, in, um, in Philippi. And that is the community to which Paul wrote his letter to the Philippians. And then obviously Paul moved on, went to other towns. As you know, the local churches were left in the hands of presbyters or priests and deacons and overseers. The overseers are what you would call now bishops. But Lydia's heart was inflated, enlarged to the point that she put herself and her resources to the use of the newly found community. She said, this is my home. 
come on in, preach from here. That's what happens when the Spirit of God fills us. When grace touches us, we cannot but say, here I am, I'm yours, use me. And so the idea is to know that whomever God sends our way, that's a possible, an opportunity for us to announce a word of forgiveness and reconciliation. There is a book that Ernest Hemingway wrote, The Capital of the World. The story goes that um, a child wanted to become a matador in Spain, and, but he was constantly in conflict with his father. His father didn't want him to become a matador. It's a dangerous job. Why would you kill yourself doing that? But the child was so obsessed with it that he left home. Father found out, and he went to Madrid in search of his son. He couldn't find him, so he posted a note in the local newspaper saying, Paco, now Paco was a popular name in Spain. Paco, I love you. I forgive you. I want to support you. I want to love you. Meet me in front of the newspaper tomorrow at noon. The next day, Father goes in front of the newspaper and he finds about 800 packers waiting for him. <laughs> we are in so much need of forgiveness and grace and reconciliation that you can't believe it. The world is hurting. We need to have that word for the world. And the Spirit is ready to aid us, the Advocate, the consoler, the encourager. Those are all translations of the same Greek word. The Spirit is ready to help us. Now in the same John 14 chapter where we read that, we hear that Jesus says, if you trust my word, you will keep it. Obviously, if you don't trust me, you'll forget it. But if you trust me, keep my word. Let it dwell in you. As a matter of fact, the Father and the Spirit and I will make a home in you. Well, that is towards the end of chapter 14. At the beginning of chapter 14, Jesus says, let me go. Let me go. I'll be with you only for a while longer, but I need to go and prepare a house for you. That house Jesus wants to prepare is in our heart. That's where God wants to dwell. Now, obviously, we need to, uh, we thought, originally I thought that preparing a home for Jesus was to put things in order in my life. But that's not what the gospel is saying. It says that Jesus will do the job for us. Jesus goes ahead of us to prepare a home for us. All we need to do is to be available. How much available do we want to be? Do we want to be just as much as having a small apartment in our heart? How about a town hall? Or maybe a villa? But why don't we go all the way in and get a castle? In our, home, in our heart. Trees of Avila spoke about the interior castle. That's where we encounter God. In that fabulous home, there are many rooms. And Jesus wants to get those rooms ready for us. Let us open ourselves to God. Let us have Him create a home for us in our heart, for the Spirit, for Jesus, for the Father. How much peace, how much joy, how much happiness. 
Let us trust God with our whole heart. Amen. Amen. Holy One, we confess that we have wandered far from you. We have not trusted your promises. We have ignored your prophets in our own day. We have squandered our inheritance of grace. We have failed to recognize you in our ways. Have mercy on us. Forgive us and turn us again to you. Teach us to follow in your ways. Assure us again of your love. And help us to love our neighbor. Amen. Beloved in Christ, the word draws near to you, and all who call out to God shall be saved. In Jesus, God comes to you again and again and gathers you under wings of love. In Jesus' name, your sins are forgiven. God journeys with you and teaches you how to live in love. Amen. has made us his people to our baptism into Christ 
living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. We believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and he seated at the right hand of God. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We have all the baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church people in need, and all of creation. God of new life, open your church to the unexpected ways your spirit is at work. Guide bishops, pastors, deacons, and lay leaders in their visioning, partnership, and planning. Surround us with your peace. God, in your mercy. Give a vision of increase and abundant harvest for farmers, laborers, and gardeners who are beginning their growing season. Join their efforts with the goodness of creation to feed all living things. God, in your mercy. Shine your light of wisdom and peace among nations when those in power seek to assert dominance over others, confound their ways, and make them yield to your humble authority. God, in your mercy, give safe haven to those seeking healing, liberation, or peace. We pray especially for the victim, victims of the Topps grocery store shooting in Buffalo, New York, and for their loved ones. For victims of the Irvine Taiwanese Presbyterian Church, the shooting in Laguna Woods, California, and for their loved ones. For all who live in fear of racially or politically motivated violence, that they may be safe from harm. For people, families, and communities affected by gun violence. For the loved ones of the one million Americans who have died of COVID-19, and the six million people who have died of COVID-19 globally. Create places filled with hospitality where hurting people find your loving presence and wholeness. God, in your mercy, uphold the work of ministries and organizations in our communities who assist people experiencing homelessness, citizens returning from prison, and all marginalized people. Accomplish your will through their efforts. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 
assemble your people at rivers, streams, and fonts where we remember our baptism and welcome others into the communion of saints. Gather us with those who have died, especially Janet Resinello, when we meet together at your river of life. We also pray in thanksgiving for Norma and Art Dietrich, who died a year ago. God, in your mercy. In your mercy, O God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer each other a sign of God's peace. Blessed are you, O God, ruler of heaven and earth. Day by day you shower us with blessings. As you have raised us to new life in Christ, give us glad and generous hearts, ready to praise you and to respond to those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may hold the communion kit in your hands now. I will let you know when it's time to consume it together. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join the unending hymn. merciful, O God, our rock and our salvation. When the earth was a formless world, a formless void, you formed order and beauty. When Abraham and Sarah were barren, you sent them a child. When the Israelites were enslaved, you led them to freedom. You entered our sorrows in Jesus, our brother. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper. 
took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering his death, we cry out, Amen. Amen. Celebrating his resurrection, we shout, Amen. Amen. Trust in his presence in every time and place, we plead, Amen. Amen. O oh God, you are breath. O oh God, you are bread. O oh God, you are wine. O oh God, you are fire. O God, most majestic, O God, most motherly, O God, our strength and our song. Grant us such life, the life of the Father to the Son, the life of the Spirit of our risen Savior, life in you, now and forever. Let us pray the prayer Jesus himself gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The reason Christ dwells with us here, all were hungry, all were thirsty, come. Christ given for you. Please join me in consuming the elements now. Body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Life-giving God, 
In the mystery of Christ's resurrection, you send light to conquer darkness, water to give new life, and the bread of life to nourish your people. Send us forth as witnesses to your Son's resurrection, that we may show your glory to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. God, the author of life, Christ, the living cornerstone and the life-giving spirit of adoption, bless you now and forever. People of Nativity, what is our mission? With the birth of Jesus in our hearts, we carry life and love to the world. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace. Share the good news. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. <laughs>